Hey guys, Mr. Cheeps here. Do you want to know how to break stuff? So today, we are going to be taking a look at the Cell Fracture add-on for Blender, as it is extremely useful for rigid body simulations. Common use cases involve absolutely destroying things, as seen here. The Cell Fracture add-on comes bundled into Blender, but we need to go into the user preferences to enable it. I'm going to go up to Edit, click on Preferences, head to the Add-ons tab, and search for Cell Fracture. I'm just going to toggle this on, and now we are ready to go. So we have our default cube here, unaware of its grim fate. I'm going to select it, and now we have two ways to run the Cell Fracture script. We can go up to the Object menu, click Quick Effects, and select Cell Fracture from there. Or we can use F3 to bring up the search menu and type in Cell Fracture to find this Cell Fracture Selected Mesh Objects option. Once we have selected that, this menu will come up. We have a lot of options for how to fracture this cube, so let's figure out what each one of these options does. The point source will be the source of the fracturing. Own verts will generate a fractured cell for each vertex in our object. So if I run this on the default cube, we will get 8 cells since the cube has 8 vertices. If I go into edit mode and add a loop cut, running this another time, we can see that I get another 4 cells for those 4 extra vertices added by the cut. The child verts option functions about the same way, but it's based off of the vertices of a child object. If I add in an icosphere and parent it to the cube, I can select this child verts and run the script again. You can see that it will generate cells based off of the icosphere rather than the vertices of our default cube. This is dependent on where the child object is located though. Own particles and child particles fracture off of particle systems rather than vertices. I'm going to give my cube a particle system and set the start and end frame to 1 so that they will all be generated on the same frame. I'm also going to expand the source dropdown and change the particles to emit from volume rather than faces, so now I have a bunch of particles on the inside of my cube. We are running into a problem here. We have 1000 particles in our system, but running this script doesn't give us 1000 cells. That is because it is clamped by the source limit value. Because this right here is set to 100, it will only take 100 of the particles when fracturing. If I want all 1000 of my cells, I'm going to have to increase this, and of course it takes far longer to generate now. Child particles will use particles to generate fractures just like before, but off of a child object once again. Pretty easy to understand. And this last one, Annotation Pencil, is pretty cool. For any older Blender users wondering what the Annotation Pencil is, it's just the renamed Grease Pencil. If I go over here and select this pencil, I can draw out where I want the fractures to come from. I would suggest changing the pencil settings to draw on a surface rather than the 3D cursor, so you can draw your fracture points directly onto your mesh. This function is especially useful if you need your object to fracture at a very specific point. We can select multiple of these fracturing options just by holding down shift. If I select own particles to use the particle system from earlier and select annotation pencil as well, we can see that it will fracture through the whole object from the particles, but be more fractured around those lines that I've drawn with the pencil. We've already talked about the source limit, how many input points will be used for fracturing. Noise just randomizes the fracturing. Remember how the cube fractured into 8 perfect squares using its own vertices earlier? If I crank up this noise value, the fracturing is a lot more random. And the last thing for these basic cell fracture settings is the cell size with x, y, and z values. If I scale this extremely low on any of these axes, it will stretch out a lot. Alright, that's looking pretty good, but it can get even better with recursive shattering. If I give this a couple recursion levels using this value, you can see that some areas will become extremely fractured, while others are left with big shards. Again, we have a source limit slider, but this one only applies to recursion. Clamp recursion will stop the recursive fracturing process when this number of objects is reached. 
Both source limit and clamp recursion will be disabled if you give it a value of zero, but be careful. You do not want to end up with infinite recursions. Now this random slider will increase or decrease the chance of recursion. If I set this to zero, no recursive fracturing happens, and if I set it to one, it shatters across the entire object. All these buttons over here are different options for what the recursion will affect. It can be set to affect small cells, big cells, cells close to the 3D cursor, or cells far away from the 3D cursor. We can also just have it happen to anything at random. And with that, we have some really good fracturing. These other settings don't really change the actual fracturing too much, but do give us some convenience. We have a toggle to set the shading of interior faces to smooth, and a toggle that supposedly gives us sharp edges. I don't really know if it does that or not. We also have a toggle to give us a vertex group for all the interior faces, and these three weird toggles here. Leave match data enabled all the time, it just preserves materials and such from the original mesh. I don't really know what apply split edge does. I've tried different things with it toggled on and off, and it doesn't really seem to do much. I'd assume that split islands is supposed to do something too, but I, again, can't see a difference with it on or off. So leave a comment down below if you know what either of those two toggles actually does. Margin gives us a little space between the cells, which can be useful for physics simulations, and the material value determines what material slot is assigned to the inside faces. I'm going to give the default cube two materials, one red and one blue. If I leave the material slot at zero and fracture, it will use the red material. If I set it to one, it will use the blue material for the interior faces. The recenter object toggle will set the origins of our fractured cells back to the center of themselves after the fracturing takes place. I would leave these on because it's especially important for physics simulations. You don't want your object origins to be way out outside of the actual mesh. If you type a name of a collection into this box, the cells will be generated in this collection rather than in the collection of the original object. If a collection with that name does not exist yet, Blender will create a new one using that name. And finally, we have these last three debug toggles. Show progress real time just gives us this cool fracturing animation as the script runs. You don't need this, but I think it looks cool. Debug points will generate extra objects to show what fracture points are used. And this last toggle requires a bit of explanation. At the end of the process, a boolean modifier is used to keep the cells within the original bounds of the object that we ran the script on. Debug boolean skips applying that modifier so that it can still be seen and applied on the generated cells. And now that we've gone through all that, we know what these cell fracture settings do. The process for a rigid body simulation using this would generally be to select your object and then cell fracture it. Once that's done, we'd go up to the object menu and down to rigid body and click add active. Now that those are physics enabled, we could just keep them selected and add some constraints with the connect button. Now we just have a big fractured block. And if you want to change any settings across all of the cells or constraints, you can select them all, go into the rigid body settings, change something, right click on what you changed and click copies to selected. So if you want to shatter your cube and then make the constraints breakable and drop it from somewhere as seen here, you could do that. Cell fracturing is really cool and when combined with breakable constraints, it looks really, really awesome. And with that, we have reached the end of this video. In the next episode of Rigid Body World, we will look at texturing a fractured object so that your textures can actually line up, and we'll also talk about tricks to make your rigid body simulations better and better looking in the future. I want to thank you all for watching, and have a great day.